Hello, hello, and welcome to the Holistic Fitness Podcast, where you'll learn how to get your goals without burning out. I'm your host, Laurie, and this show isn't just about movement and nutrition. You probably already know that exercise and nutrition is important for your mental and physical health and well-being. It's also about stress management, mindset, shedding those limiting beliefs, and working through some of that childhood trauma while you're at it. Today, I'm joined by Ermi Hossein. Ermi is a YouTuber, blogger, and author. Her book, Discovering Your Identity, A Rebirth from an Interracial Struggle, talks about her own struggle in finding her identity. She speaks to being a third culture kid and how you can discover your identity and who you truly are. She also speaks about her struggles of working out and becoming a Muay Thai enthusiast. I'm really excited to share this one with you all. Hey, goal getters, just chiming in quickly to say that if you like this podcast or found any sort of value while listening, I'd love it if you could help me out and give this a quick rating or review wherever you listen to the Holistic Fitness Podcast. Five-star reviews help this podcast get in front of other listeners who could benefit from the actionable tips and insights on this podcast. If you want to help get the message of getting balanced fitness to the world and help others get their goals without burning out, please take five seconds to give this podcast a five-star review. Keep shining. How are you going this morning, Ermi? Pretty well, and you? Yeah, really good. It's awesome to have you. Uh, You have such a unique story and I love that you're a third culture kid that's had so many different experiences just with discovering your identity. You've written a book about it. You've also had a fitness journey as well, like from hating working out and perhaps not being so much the sporty type and moving into that. So I'm super excited to dive into you and learning about you and how you can help our listeners today with just inspiring them through your story. But first, I feel like anyone who's bold enough to get on a podcast or share their story, write a book, there's a reason why. What's the context that I need to know about your life to understand like why you wrote your book, why you help people in the way you do today? So why I wrote my book, I think it was just more about... It was something I wanted to... I always wanted to accomplish. I think a lot of people always say, oh yeah, I want to write a book. But I think no one ever goes and actually finish writing the book. I think yeah. it's just it's just a goal there. But it's like, okay, I want to do that. But no one ever does it. And so, and I, um, and I always wanted to do it, but I, I wasn't quite sure when it was going to happen. So I was like pretty like clear about it. I was like, you know what? This is going to be my goal for 2022. Then I'm going to write this book. And so it all started because I was struggling as a third culture kid. I did struggle mm-hmm. all my life. I feel like I couldn't really fit anywhere. Like I wasn't because my parents are from Bangladesh and I was born and raised in Italy. Now I live in Canada. So. And I did have a lot of like struggle trying to fit in Mm -hmm. and especially being a South Asian woman growing up in a Western society, there are always a lot of conflict. There are always a lot of expectation by family relatives. And so it made it really hard for me to fit into, into, to fit somewhere. Mm. And I never felt like I was fitting the box, you know? And so then I was like, okay, you know what? I do want to talk about this more and more. And I started to realize, especially being on social media, that there are more and more people like me. There are Mm. more and more girls like me, not just like having that my same background, but there are also other people having different kinds of background trying to like, you know, fitting somewhere. And so I was like, you know what? I want to talk about it. I started to get invited into different podcasts where I would talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know what? I want to have this written like somewhere. So that's how I started to write my book. And before writing this book, I actually read another book called How to Write a Book in 30 Days. I read that while I was on vacation. And then I was like, okay, I think I'm ready. So I was very, very like motivated. I was like, you know what? I'm a go-getter. So I actually Mm -hmm. sat down every day. Like I would sit down for 30 minutes, an hour, and actually I would start writing like chapters. And my book is more like an autobiography. So it's very, um, so it was very, easy for me to go through it because I was just writing down all these memories of me when I was as, as when I was a kid you know and I would talk about different like episodes such as going to school or you know dating or eating out and things like that things that people take for granted but sometimes they're not so granted for like a South Asian 
women because we have so many restrictions on what we can do, what we cannot do and what people perceive as good and bad. And so mm. it took me 30 days to write it. And then I had someone who helped me to like edit it. Um, and then I self-published it after two weeks. And wow. so it was, um, the book itself is called Discovering Your Identity, a Rebirth from Interracial Struggle. It's, and it's more like, uh, reflections about me, uh, growing up at, as a South Asian person in a Western society, basically. Wow. And I can't, you know, imagine what that would be like. And I can't, I, I've traveled to South Asia and India and Thailand, but I, I don't necessarily know what these expectations are. Can you share more about how being a South Asian woman impacted the way you interacted with society in like Italy and in, uh, Canada? So simple things like, uh, you know, women in South Asian society are seen a certain way. They are expected to behave a certain way. Um, it's a, there is a little bit of double standards in that sense. So mm. things like, you know, okay, you have to come back home like before seven or you have to come back home before six. Whereas if you're a boy, no one cares. You can say out as long as you want. Mm. Or, you know, if you're like walking on a street or it's better that you have someone with you because it's not safe. But then if you're a mm. boy, like no one says anything. So these were like little things. And I remember like when I was a kid, I was never allowed to go to my friend's house. Or if I was, I had to come back home a certain hour before the night, you know, forget about the night. Like uh, usually around eight, I, I was supposed to be home. Um, I wasn't allowed to go out every day because then there was a perception that, you know, People would think, you know, you're always hanging out outside, which wasn't seen really, really well by the community. Um, other things such as I was never allowed to go to the cinema. Uh, I wasn't allowed to have like guys as friends. So there was like wow. little things like that, that makes it really hard because there is a perception by the society that they might think you're not a nice girl, even though you weren't doing anything, anything, uh, bad. And so there, there are these kind of expectations. Mm. And of course, I feel like after I moved to Canada, it, Canada really opened my horizon. I started to see things differently. Um, even my circle of friendship that I had, like just really opened up like my mind because I had people from different backgrounds. And this is where I started to realize that, you know, the, what the, the culture that I grew up, it's a culture that it's very conservative, but it doesn't mean mm. that's the right way. So I started to be a bit more liberal and think differently. And I started to see that whatever I was doing or whatever I wasn't doing wasn't really wrong. And so now I try to, you know, I try, I see this, that this is normal, you know, it's, it's okay if you're going out and coming home, coming home late, you know, it's like, uh, mm. it's, it's not a crime, but for some, for so many could be seen as a bad thing. So little things like that. Mm, that really puts things into perspective because I know like growing up in Western culture, I, a lot of women feel like it's unfair that we have these like expectations compared to men. But when you put it in perspective of some of those expectations you had as a South Asian woman, it's, it, and I've been to India, so I've definitely seen the conservative side of the culture as well. And I love, um, I, I don't know as much about like Bangladesh culture, but certainly in South Asia and in India, like I love their culture. It was awesome, but it certainly puts things in perspective of what things look like. I'm really curious to know how you rediscovered your identi identity because I can't imagine what it would have been like to be in that box. Like you would have felt like you were doing things wrong. Can you talk me through that process of discovering your identity? Yeah, so I remember then when I was in, I was living in Italy, I, my friends were pretty much Italian, did not have any Bengali friends. Mm. And, um, I was always very self-conscious, like super self-conscious. I look, I don't, I don't look Italian, like aesthetically, I look very South Asian. And it would always make me really conscious that, you know, as much as I, I am grow growing up in Italy as much as I have like an, a circle of friends who are Italian, as much as I'm like surrounded by Italian people, the truth is I'm not Italian. Mm -hmm. However, I always felt like I was very much Italian inside because my the culture that I was growing up was very open-minded. But then when I would go back home, even though like, you know, it was pretty, it, it was a Bengali household. Um, and I knew that, you know, I am Bengali by blood. I still felt like I did not belong there because my mentality mm. was completely different. 
And so my whole life has struggled with that because I felt like I'm not really sure what I'm fitting in. But I think when I came to Canada and I started to see that there are more people like me because Canada, it's basically like a melting pot. Yeah. I started to realize that you don't, you don't really have to fit one or the other. You can just embrace both. But mm-hmm. it really took me like a couple of years ago, like, and I'm telling you, this came to me, like this hit me only when I was like 24, 25, that I think I have to find my identity and know who I am because people would ask me questions like, okay, what's your nationality or mm. who are you? And this is where I was like, I'm not really sure what to say. Um, yeah. If I would say like I'm Bengali, people will question because they would hear my Italian accent. Or if I say I would Italian, people would question it regardless because they're like, are you sure you're Italian because you don't look Italian? And this is where I, I started to like reflect on it, start to question it. And it was only a couple of years ago that I was like, you know what? I have to find a way where I'm okay with both of them. And I have mm. to embrace because I feel like if I'm saying I'm Bengali, I'm not saying half of the story. And if I say I'm Italian, I'm not saying the other half of the story. So I now I tell people that I am Italian Bengali. Um, and it was like a lot of inner work that I ha- have done like through uh, through the past, I would say three, four years. It wasn't even long, a long time ago. Mm. And now when people ask me like, okay, like, What's the nationality? I can say confidently that I am like Italian Bengali, even though like I am Canadian also by nationality right now. But I, I, I wouldn't say it. I cannot associate myself yet to the Canadian one, but I can mm. associate myself to the Bengali and Italian one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I relate to that on a spiritual level, Ermi, because yeah, obviously I sound Australian, but I am American. And I remember as a child, like always being so proud of being American and sharing that I was American. And it would trigger me when people are like, but you're not. And it's like, but I feel American. Um, yeah. So I totally get that. How did you embrace both sides? How? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know what? I just did it. I just followed um, and did what I what I what I wanted to do. Like I just pursued my passions, and I think the little things that I did they just empowered me. And I think I just came to accept myself um, because when I was growing up, I remember that sometimes I I didn't like what the Bengali culture was like because of the restrictions mm. that were imposed on me. Um, and then I started to see, okay, but there is beauty in that, you know, like yeah. I, I should not focus my time on the negative things. I think, mm. you know, if I focus on the beautiful things, like the tradition, the food, the clothes, you know, and the language itself, I think there's still something beautiful in it. Mm. And, and I, I think it was just like me working through things that I love. Like I started to attend public speaking classes. I started to like do volunteering. I started to have a blog, a YouTube channel. I think little by little, I, I started to like accept myself. Those things empowered me. Um, and then I was like, um, like I also saw other girls as well going through the same thing. I would read their stories and they went through the same thing as well. There's one girl in particular who lives in Australia and she's Bengali who went through the same struggle. And she was like, you know what? It's all about like celebrating diversity and accepting people for who they are. And I, and she was also saying like, there shouldn't be this expectation from like parents who are like moving from their own country, going to a Western country that their kids will be just, you know, what their native culture is, but also be open to accept them that they will have other cultures embedded in them. Mm. And so for me, it was just like really like pursuing my passions, accepting myself for who I am. And and then sometimes I also see that in food as well, because I love pasta a lot, but we also have like pasta in, in the Bengali culture, but which is served more like, um, it's served more like a snack and it's a spicy type of pasta. And so I, right. this is where I like, it just hit me. I'm like, you know what? That there is a little bit of like fusion there, you know, and that's mm. how I, and that's how I try to like see I try to see the beauty in it, basically. Mm, I love that. Being able to see the beauty in both. <laughs> but also what got me is like following your passions and figuring out what your passions are. And, you know, holistic fitness is definitely about like finding your passion in fitness, finding your passion in food, but also finding your passion in, you know, your career and your relationships. Because if you don't have all that sort of stuff sorted, you don't have the available energy to be able to get your goals, whether it's fitness, whether it's, you know, business or whatever it is. Can you tell me, a lot of people don't know 
their identity. They also don't know what they're passionate about. Can you talk more about the process of you figuring out that you are passionate about blogging and public speaking and the nonprofits that you're helping? So I think it all started just by pure coincidence. Like I never thought of myself of having a blog, having a YouTube channel, like never mm. in my whole life I would have thought of that. But I think I was always curious about everything. Like I'm generally very, very curious. And I think because, you know, we were in a period where everything was like in a lockdown and just had time to think about it. I was like, okay, you know what? Let me see how I would feel about, you know, having a blog, having a YouTube channel. Mm. And it was just a trial and error. It was literally a trial and error. And I just followed my intuition. I, love I followed that. my, I followed my intuition. I was like, let me just see how I feel about it. And I, mm. and then I don't know what it was, but it was like a boost of energy for me. And I remember like before I opened my YouTube channel, I was invited into another YouTube channel by a friend. And she was like, you know what? I'm going to help you to get out of your comfort zone. And so I was very nervous when I did my first interview, but then I was, I was like, you know what? I actually enjoyed this. Mm. And so it just started with this little spark. And then I was like, you know what? I think I want to go ahead with this. I'm going to start and have my own YouTube channel. Um, then with blogging, um, it was more by, again, it was pure coincidence. I, I know that not many people have a blog, but it's also for you, um, a way to communicate and tell the world, world who you are. Mm. And so I was like, you know what? I want to see how blogging works. I want to see if I can work on my writing skills through blogging. And so I started to blog and I was like, you know what? I actually enjoy sharing my knowledge to the world. And so it just, I just followed my intuition and the same with public speaking. Um, I remember being inspired by Meghan Markle and other speakers, mm. female speakers that talk about women's empowerment. And then like, I remember looking at them and being like, you know what? I want to be like them. And so I have to work on it. And I'm also very much about like investing in myself. I'm also like a lo- lifelong learner. Mm. Um, I always try like to keep my, my brain like stimulated. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to see how public speaking looks like. So I started to join Toastmasters and uh, I remember it was such a disaster the first time. Like it was such <laughs> a disaster. I uh, remember they called me to, 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 to give a mini speech and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> but you know what? I was like, you know what? This is how uncomfortable feels like. So mm. I'm like, I'm going to, I have to keep going until I become comfortable. So it's been four years that I've been there. Um, I'm not saying I'm a perfect speaker, but I do feel really good when I'm speaking and after speaking. Mm. Of course, pre-speaking, I'm like super nervous. I feel like the world will collapse, but I think it's very <laughs> normal that you feel that way. But post-speaking, I'm like, oh, I'm feeling much better. I'm feeling much more confident. And I think they really have built me to to shape my identity because I feel like in the last couple of years, I became much more confident about myself and what mm. I can offer and also to be the advocate for myself because I have developed public speaking skills. And so it was literally following my intuition, following my fear and just see where they led me basically. Yeah, that's awesome. It's like A, following your intuition, but B, trial and error as well. Trialing different things and deciding like what sticks. And then I love that you mentioned about being the advocate for yourself and also getting comfortable with being uncomfortable because when you try something new, like I look at my first TikTok videos and my TikTok did pretty well pretty quickly, but I still look at those first TikTok videos and I'm like, wow, Lori, they're bad. You know, you've got to be really like try different stuff out and not expect to be good. And I I definitely think in the fitness journey specifically, a lot of people are afraid to look bad in the gym or to be the worst person and the least flexible in the yoga class or whatever it is. What do you think Because something you said earlier really piqued my curiosity. You finished a book. Most people want to write a book, but never actually get it done. Why do you think you're capable of acting on your intuition and getting stuff done? What's the secret there? I just think I'm a go-getter. A go-getter. Love it. (laughs) Yes. I'm a go-getter. I like to get things accomplished. Mm. Like I, I'm very self-disciplined in every sense. I'm very self-disciplined and I read a lot of books about, you know, uh, like building habits. Like I'm just, Mm. I'm reading now atomic habits and I wake up like early enough in the morning to like go through that and read about it. And I think, 
Like as a person, I'm a go-getter. I like to get things accomplished and I, and I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an accomplisher basically. I like to mm. get things accomplished and I think that's how I get my drive, my motivation. I like to have like a to-do list. I like to be productive and I, I like to maximize every hour of my day. I don't like mm. to use and I don't like to waste any hour of my day. And everything that I do, it's based on like accomplishing things or like enriching myself through learning. I really, really enjoy that. Mm. How do you embody that mindset? I'm sure a lot of people listening would love to be in that place. How did you get there? You know what? That's a very tough question because I don't know it was about getting there. I think it was about finding myself. I think it was always Mm. probably inside of me Um, because like I would do things without being conscious about why I'm doing things. Like I remember, like I would tell my friends, oh, you know, I'm doing, going to volunteer today. I really, really enjoy it and stuff like that. And I would tell my friends, okay, I'm going to take this course today. And they were like, you know what? I always felt you were ambitious when you, when you were going to school with us, but it never clicked in my mind that I was ambitious. So I think it was like mm-hmm. little cues that my friends would give me that just really made me realize who I was as a person, what my personality was. And I think, they would tell me these things and I would be, I become aware of my, mm. of this trait. And I'll be like, you know what? You're, you're actually right. And I think it was just becoming more and more aware of who I was. So I don't think it was something that I, I like I worked on getting. Mm. It was something that was inside of me that I just had to cultivate and find myself and discover mm. basically. Yeah. I think we all have a go-getter inside of us as well. And it sounds like you had an extremely supportive environment that saw that in you and hyped you up. And and I don't want to say enhanced you, but like when they elevate that part of yourself and make that known, then it makes you want to, you know, go get your goals. Yes, exactly. I love that. Tell me about your fitness journey because (laughs) I know you mentioned that you hated working out when you were at school and now you have it as a part of your daily routine. And I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate to that. So talk me through that journey. Yes, and I'm pretty sure my my teacher would be so proud of me, um, <laughs> my gym teacher. So basically, what happened is, um, okay, back in Italy we have like two hours gym classes, and basically they would bring us to the gym. They would make us do like uh, you know all those machines, or sometimes they would make us play volleyball. And I remember when we had that lesson, I used to hate it. I was like, why do we have to have this? Why is it important to work out? And every time I would like pretend I was sick or I would just pray that, you know, the class was canceled. I used to hate it. I used to hate working out. I used to hate going to the gym. And uh, like, I, like I, if, if I would, would work out, it was just because I was forced to it and I needed the grit. <laughs> and, then, and then what happened is, I moved to Canada and I was like, you know what? I think I probably have to start going to the gym. And I think it was also my environment because I would see people going to the gym. I was like, oh, is this like a something that people do? <laughs> <laughs> because in Italy, as I was growing up, like I was like 15, 16, my, my friends would not go to, to the gym. They yeah. would all hate it. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to start going to the gym. And so I remember going to the gym doing the running and I used to hate it. Even then I used to hate it. And I was mm. like, I don't know why. Why do I have to do this? I stopped. But then I started to realize that, you know what, I need this for my health. And it, and then mm. I also, so initially I was like, I need this for my health. But then I also felt like I need to like lose weight. And mm. so I started to go to the gym for that. But then I actually saw that there were classes offered at my university. These were, these were like boot camp um, courses or HIIT workouts. Mm. And so I started to, to start, I started to go to those classes and I was like, you know what? I love this. I actually yeah. love how like, first of all, I love the environment. I love the structure. And then I remember like sweating and sweating and dying from the workout, but I was <laughs> so happy after that. And then I realized, you know what? I actually do enjoy this so much. So I would go mm. like twice a week and then it became like part of my life. So I would say it was around 2016 that my like fitness journey started, but it wasn't It wasn't to lose weight. It was just to be good about myself and also to be mentally uh, healthy. Mm. And so I would go like twice a week. I would do this like uh, boot camp workout. 
And then what happened is uh, last year, I actually uh, joined a Muay Thai course. So I did it for three months. I did it for three months and I was like, you know what? I think every woman needs a self-defense course. Mm -hmm. And I felt there was a warrior inside of me. And so I started to like go to those classes. And I never in my whole life I would thought I would have done, I would have done like Muay Thai boxing classes. But then I was surrounded by other women who were also trying to be like empowered and be more confident, mm. you know, physically, uh, like strong physically and mentally. And so I was like, you know what? I actually enjoy this and it, do- it does make me feel good. And I felt there was a warrior mm. inside of me. And now what happened is um, I had to stop for, for, for a bit for this course, but I go to HIIT workouts along with other women. And when I'm not working out, like when I'm not going to the HIIT workouts, I try to run outside or at the gym and I run in the winter as well with the minus 10 degree. Oh my goodness. And and I think it's because it makes me like the whole concept like of working out makes me think of myself of a warrior. And that's how mm. I associate it. Because whenever I'm working out, I feel like I'm a strong woman. I'm a warrior. I can, I'm invincible. I can like, you know, conquer the world. So that's how I associate my uh, like uh, fitness journey. And now I just love it. I cannot st- stay one week with, without working out. I like, I have to work out now. It's part of my like identity. And I have like a friend as well who feels the same way too. She works out four times a week and she's like, you know what? The world can end, but I have to work out. And I tell her, I told her the same thing. I said, there could be an earthquake, but you still will be, you, you still see me running in a treadmill. Mm. <laughs> what a stark difference from going from absolutely hating working <laughs> out to like not being able to live without it and it being a part of your identity. Yes. Yes. There is so much to unpack there as well. I mean, it sounds like some of the things like what, what I'm hearing from that is that you tried a few different things, like you recognized you hated running. And while you still went into the gym, like you're like, hey, I'm just going to try something new. So it definitely was that trial and error. Like, but then it was also your love of continuous education. Like, oh, you know what? I want to do a three month course in, in Mai Tai because I want to learn this. But then also attaching a feeling to working out while like I know you mentioned there was an element of weight loss but that wasn't your main goal you also had like mental and physical kind of goals in terms of health but then you attach this feeling of being like an empowered warrior as well Um, which I think personally for me when I got into fitness quite a bit I felt like Beyonce I would channel Beyonce and I'm like definitely an entertainer type per- personality. <laughs> so Beyonce is probably like a good, and I just like, I'd be on the cross trainer. And if I was pretending I was Beyonce, like in one of her, like in the countdown music video I'm thinking about right now, that definitely worked for me. And lastly, the environment aspect is really similar to what you mentioned mm-hmm. in terms of, um, in terms of how you came to find, to discover your identity. I'm seeing so many parallels. Like you had an amazing, and to be honest, I hit workouts are my favorite workouts to train. I love coaching hit workouts. They're just my favorite. Um, and, and the energy is, is electric. So there's just so many good things that you did along your journey. And you also didn't force yourself. You said that you did two boot camps to start and then it was gradual and now you have a daily habit. So you just did it in such a healthy way. Yes, actually, I also because I feel like even working out is trial and error. And I tried mm-hmm. Pilates and I tried yoga, but you know what? They would make me fall asleep. So I was like, <laughs> eh. so I was like, you know what? I know what I'm what I'm not good with. And and so I tried a little bit of everything until I found something that I like. And mm-hmm. so I think it's just finding the perfect match. You know, like I'm not saying people should do hit workouts. I think it's about finding what what's right for you. Yeah, so for me was that. I totally agree. I wish we approached fitness, and I think this is why I do what I do. I wish we approached fitness with that same level of curiosity of do I like this class? Like I'm going to try this for four weeks. No, I don't like this, and this is why. And I also think that social media can be a little bit detrimental because we'll have this like 30 second TikTok that's like you should do Pilates instead. Of, and I posted TikToks that are like, yeah, hit workouts aren't for everyone. You can increase your cortisol and maybe you should try Pilates if you're highly stressed. Totally believe that. But it's very specific advice for specific people. And ultimately, we all need to try different things and figure out what's right for us in this moment. Exactly, exactly. Actually, for me, uh, what helped mostly was following the right people because I also mm. uh, like follow... Um, 
fitness trainer, those, those big ones. And every time I would see them running, I would say, you know what? I think I also want to go run. And so yeah. those were very motivating for me because I would feel mm. like they, like I can, like I would look at those women and be like, okay, they look like warriors and that's what I want to be. And so I would be really influenced by that and I would be also inspired by that. So every time I see them like working out, I was like, you know what? I shouldn't be sitting here. I should go and run outside. Mm, I love that. Can you dive more into following the right people? What does following the right people mean to you? So, because I feel like on social media, like it has good and bad and you can like follow random people that are, you know, trying to sell things, selling you things that are not right. And for me, following the right people is just people that are like inspirational, very motivational. Uh, They're not trying to sell you things. A lot of the fitness uh, trainers that I follow, these are like big names. I'm I'm trying to think of like a name, but I cannot think of (laughs) one right now. Uh, They they always like promote like healthy eating, for instance. You know, they don't say deprive yourself of this, but they say, you know, it's you should eat a little bit of everything or they try to promote like healthy style, healthy habits. Um, I also follow the same people are also like people that are based on like giving you productivity uh, tips, uh, building Mm -hmm. good habits, you know, talking about mindset, journaling, you know, how to, it's not just about like being physically fit, but also like be fit, like in every, like more Mm -hmm. like, um, uh, how to say like more like um I can I cannot sit no more like like um holistically holistically there you go <laughs> and there you go uh be fit holistically and that's what I like because mm. I think they just really help you to be a better version of yourself and be build that aspect of your life rather than just focusing in one thing and so I these are the people that I follow people that are like inspirational sharing tips talking about their own journey as well because a lot of them were not perfect. A lot of them went through the same struggle. You know, they, mm. they they probably didn't like working out, but then they were like, you know what? I have to do something for myself. And it's about like going back to self-love, self-care. And so I, I like to follow those kind of people because, you know, when you follow the right people, it uplifts your mind too. And uh, it, it changes also your mindset and changes the way you see the world. Hey, Holistic Fitness fam, a quick message from one of our sponsors, Ned. As you all know, I recommend good nutrition, movement, and stress management practices before supplementing so you know what type of supplementation that your body actually needs. For me, I supplement with very few products, but Ned is one of them. I'm a type A, high-energy, ambitious business girly with massive goals, and sometimes I honestly just need to chill out and relax a bit. I've found that both Ned's de-stress and sleep blends fit in with my busy lifestyle and ambitious goals, but I was honestly not a big fan of CBD products before trying Ned, mostly because of the culture surrounding weed. I just didn't want something that was going to alter my state of mind so that I became much less of a goal getter or less ambitious. That was until I learned about full spectrum hemp and their benefits. Ned blends a chock full of premium CBD and a full spectrum hemp of active cannabinoids. Ned's full spectrum hemp oil nourishes the body's endocannabinoid system to offer functional support for stress, sleep, inflammation, and balance. These products are science-backed, nature-based solutions that offer an alternative to prescription and over-the-counter drugs. All of Ned's full spectrum hemp oil is extracted from USDA certified organic hemp plants grown by an independent farmer named Jonathan in Colorado. I'm obviously a big fan, but don't take just my word for it. Ned CBD products have over 2,000 five-star reviews and they work with incredible partners in the medical field like Dr. Caroline Leaf, Dr. Christian Gonzalez and Dr. Will Cole. Ned is providing Holistic Fitness podcast listeners a very special discount. If you'd like to give Ned a try, listeners get 15% off Ned products with the code Lori Lee, L-O-R-I-L-E-E. Thanks, Ned, for sponsoring the show and offering a natural remedy to bring balance to so many people's well-being. That digital environment is so important. It's almost as important as the friends you spend time with because we're on our phones so much. We need to consider our digital circle of influence. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. And I, and I do agree on that because when you have the right people around you, whether it's like digital or not digital, it really affects your whole well-being. You know, you don't want to be around toxic people because then, you know, mm. they will just throw toxicity at you. And so I'm, I'm very careful about the people that I choose, the people that I want to be surrounded with, because I think we just need people that are like supporting you, encouraging you and helping you to be the best version of yourself. Mm, and that's probably why you bet you're able to get so much done and make every hour count. And it really does matter. I want to dive into eating. You mentioned that you like to follow people that don't tell you to deprive yourself of anything. You also mentioned you are into your health. But if we think about like Bengali food and Italian food, a lot of it's like carb heavy. I'm thinking about pasta, pizza, curries, you know, how do you balance embracing your culture and remaining healthy? Yeah, I love eating pasta. I, I love that. <laughs> I, I love pasta. It's, um, I don't know how to explain to you, like, I can eat pasta every day and never be tired of it. Mm-hmm. And you know what? It's, uh, it's like, I know that the past is like, you shouldn't eat pasta every day because it's bad, because it's carbs and stuff like that. But then I'm like, you know what? I'm not eating like five kilos of pasta. Like I'm eating a little bit and it's, and it's what I call my self care. You know, mm. it's important that I eat what I love. And so I eat a lot of pasta. I'll be honest about that. But I also try to like reduce um, the portion of it and try to like add a little bit of veggies. And I usually make it with pests and stuff like that. And I also eat, uh, we do eat a lot of like rice and curry at home. And so mm. it's, I try to find the balance in that, meaning that I try to eat a little bit of both and not just stick to one thing because I do appreciate a lot the Bengali food. It's it's very spicy mm-hmm. and there is a lot of uh, spices. It's very colorful, but it's also a lot of, t- very tasty. And we eat a lot of rice and uh, we also have pasta in the Bengali culture, but we eat pasta more like a snack. Mm-hmm. And it's usually served like, in, if you go to people's house, they serve it like, uh, they, they make it their special ways with spices and peppers and, I don't know, like chili peppers. They just make it spicy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I try to like balance it out. Like sometimes I would make like, you know, curry, chicken curry or, you know, beef curry. And some other days I would eat like pasta or what I do is that I eat pasta for lunch and then I eat like <laughs> my golly food in the evening. That's how I try to put a little bit of balance. And when I'm tired of both, I just go and for another cuisine, basically, like mm-hmm. maybe sushi or stuff like that. But I think, you know, because I'm, I grew up seeing people eating like, unhealthy food like drinking coca-cola like early in the morning i would be like but why do you have to do that to yourself (laughs) i I think when it comes to eating it's really more about eating everything but like in like small portions and i don't think you should deprive yourself of the things that you love like i eat i love chocolate and i have one chocolate bar every day because i just love it like the square i take a take a little bit of it because i think it's what makes me happy and i think it's Mm. important for your own mental health as well to you know to don't stop yourself like from eating the things that you love, but just have a little bit of it every day. Mm. So that's how I do it. I totally agree with that in terms of being able to have the things you enjoy, even if they're not necessarily optimal for health, uh, often for your own like mental health and because you enjoy it. And I don't think you should deprive yourself of anything, but I do love the example that you provided that it's not necessarily about what you can remove from your diet, but it's what you can add. So for example, with the pasta, making sure the carb portion, like carbs are great. I, I'm i not a proponent of keto at all. Um, I'm not a proponent of cutting out any macronutrients, to be honest. Um, but you just reduce the carb portion and then add vegetables. So when you're looking at your bowl, like if you, you've got the mar- marinara sauce and you've got pasta, what can I add rather than what can I remove and what can I deprive myself of? I think that's an awesome framework. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree on that. Um, like I, I'm also very much against with people dieting because remember mm-hmm. this was one thing that I I tried to do at the beginning, but then I was like, you know what? I'm not happy when I'm dieting. And I would see other people doing the same thing and they would be like cranky. They'll be really yeah. moody or they would have like a diet just based on juice. And I'll be like, okay, but you're like 
so mad right now. You're like pissed. And I remember seeing that and thinking of myself as well and be like, I don't know if I want that. I think we live once, we should enjoy it, but we should be mindful of what we eat. Mm. You know, if you're someone who drinks too much, like try to reduce again the portion. If you're someone who has a sweet tooth, don't have, you know, pastries every day. Just have it maybe once every once in a while. Um, and also I'm very much against di- dieting itself. Um, I remember I, I did this particular diet. Um, it's called intermittent, intermittent, intermittent fasting. fasting. Yeah. Um, I read about it. I was like, okay, I'm going to try, but I would always be so so cranky and I was like I don't know why I'm doing that to myself I think if I can build a healthy lifestyle where I'm still okay with whatever I'm eating and like working out four or five times a week I think that's more than enough and so that's how I built my relationship with food with working out and uh yeah and I try and I eat a little bit of everything but in like in small portion literally yeah that's so healthy though. You sound so balanced in terms of your your food. And of course, you know, you're, you're expending energy working out as well. I'm really curious. So in Western culture, I was quite lucky because my mum was really small and always tried to put on weight. So I don't have a lot of the same beliefs that I know a lot of people of Western culture did where they observed their mums like eating less and on diets. I'm curious about what it was like for you growing up being a girl in like a third culture kid and a girl, were you fed any sort of beliefs about your body or what you should be eating or how much you should be eating? So I remember when I was growing up, we were usually fed a lot of rice. Like I remember Mm. we have to eat rice and I used to hate it because it was it was the only thing we were served. And I remember coming back from school and be like, no, I want to eat pasta. I don't want to eat rice every time. But there is this conception that, you know, for some reason, like if you're too skinny, it's an issue. Wow. If you're, if, if you're too big, it's also an issue. Right. It's, so people make comments no matter what. Mm. But if you're too skinny, people will be like, oh, you lost so much weight. Are you not eating? Is, is, are any people at home feeding you? Oh, wow. But then if you're B, let's say you gain a little bit of weight, people are commenting and saying, oh, oh my God. You, you got like extra weight. Like what's going on? You know, I see, I see that you have like an extra pound. You got fat. And people are very like vocal and straight up to you telling you all this. Wow. And so... If you're too skinny is an issue, if you're too big is an issue, so there is no middle way. And there, there is a misconception on that. And of course, in uh, especially in the South Asian culture, not many people, people usually, especially like for my parents' generation, they never worked out. It's never promoted working out. Mm. Um, they don't even like enroll their kids to like classes, like playing soccer, volleyball, or stuff like that. This is not something that it's promoted and no one ever talks about it. And in, in especially in the South Asian culture, people do have health diseases because they don't work out and the food that we eat can be really fat and oily. People have like uh, cholesterol and diabetes because, you know, people are eating like things oily or things that are very sugary. And unfortunately, this is something that is still there. Like people do not promote this. If you're working out, all all they can think about is that you're trying to lose weight, even though the goal is not that. The goal is just to feel better. Mm-hmm. And so there is a lot of misconception in that, especially in the South Asian culture, where as I remember in Italy, like for some reason, people in Italy, like they eat pasta, but some, for some reason they're still skinny. Like I don't yeah. know what's going on there. They eat so much pasta and um, they eat so much pasta. They eat like, they have like five, seven courses of a meal and they're still skinny. Mm-hmm. And um and there, like in Italy, people are, you have an idea of how people in Italy look like. They're pretty skinny, even though they eat a lot. Whereas for the Statesian, it's a little bit different. Like people, you can see that they do have, they're not completely skinny. Um, they're big. <laughs> I don't even know how to say it. But uh, yeah, there is that type of uh, like stereotype in our in our mind. But of course, like in the South Asian culture, they don't promote uh, working out or stuff like that. It's all about eating and they feed you until you never stop, basically. Wow. You've achieved quite a lot then because I truly believe that 
your con- your habits are conditioned from a young age and your habits were to not like working out, to not want to work out and to be fed a lot as well. And you have found love for multiple cultures of food and you've also found love for working out when that almost wasn't looked on, looked upon as something normal. So you really, I know that there's a lot of people listening that maybe they weren't a sporty kid. Maybe they didn't, haven't found what they enjoy, but your story is quite inspiring in terms of finding something you enjoy despite not being exposed to any sorts of sports and that actually just not being promoted at all. Yes. Um, yes. And I would say like my childhood really shaped my bringing and it just, it just showed me what I didn't want to be, basically. Yeah. And so because of that, I think I was like, you know what? I don't want to be the person who's not working out. I want to be the person, mm. you know, who works out, who builds that habit. And like working out in the winter, I know not people like running outside in the winter. I know not people do it. They think I'm crazy. But you know what? It makes me feel really good about it. And mm. it's just building a habit is building your identity and build it's building your personality and I think that's very important. Um same thing with with saying no to like food that it's bad for you. You know, if oily food is bad, then it's okay to say no and don't eat it just because you're forced. And that's mm-hmm. also like I put boundaries in that too when it comes to eating. If people are forcing me to eat something that I don't want to eat, I just say no because it's bad for me. Even though people might think, no, it's good. You should eat it. You know, they, they brought it for you, but I'm like, no, but it's bad for me. It's a lot of sugar. And mm. if I don't want to, I don't want to. So it's also important about, it's also important to put boundaries when it comes to like eating as well, I think. Mm. And that can be hard in those family environments, especially when, you know, your mother cooks a meal for you or, you know, someone cooks a meal for you and you feel almost obligated to eat it even when you don't. So that's quite awesome that you've been able to set those boundaries and and say no when you don't feel like it. Yes. Yes. And it I think it's it's important to to do that to to protect yourself and your health and your whole well being. Mm. Ermi, it's been wonderful speaking to you today. I've learned so much about your journey and about some of the parallels of discovering discovering your identity and also discovering your fitness journey and how that's so similar. Before I, we do have a final question on this podcast. Before I ask you the final question, do you have anything that you wanted to share with the audience today that you feel like you haven't shared yet? Honestly, I do want to tell people to work out, Mm. but not for the purpose of losing weight. I think just for the whole purpose of like feeling good for yourself, because I think you do feel really good uh, when you work out and it doesn't have to be running. It could be literally anything. It could be also walking to like if walking for an hour or 30 minutes makes you feel good. That's more than enough. Um, and I think it just helps you to like reconnect yourself, find yourself. And it's a moment where you're like nurturing your soul. And I think it's so, so important. Mm, I love that. You found your inner warrior through working out, which I I love your journey because it's not about the aesthetics and Mm -hmm. the aesthetics can be a really great measurable goal. But once you hit that goal, it's not what's going to keep you going. Finding that inner warrior or that feeling um, and just really trusting yourself is what's going to keep you going. Yes, exactly. Totally agree with you. We have a final question. And that question is, if you were speaking to your 20-year-old self today, what sentence of advice would you give her? And this is such a tricky question. <laughs> it's like, how do I bring all my years of knowledge into one sentence? <laughs> Literally, let me see. 20 years old, what advice would they give? You know what? I probably tell her, like, start working out early, you know? Like, don't wait so late to do that. Like, honestly, I wish I'd done that when I was 16. You know what? I wish... When I think about it, I wish I was enrolled to a soccer um, mm. class. So this is what I would tell her. I would tell her, go and tell mom and dad to like enroll you into a soccer school or something like that. Because now when I look at women playing soccer, I'm like, you know what? It looks so good. I wish I, I, I wish I have learned that too when I was a kid. So I would probably tell her that. I love that. Yeah, I think that's such great advice as well. Me when I was twenty, I was partying a lot, so I could have, <laughs> um, 
I was, I always looked good, but it was because I was tearing up shapes on the dance floor. It wasn't because it was healthy. <laughs> I love that okay. though. Learn how to move from a young age. I mean, I'm sure so many people, you know, are curious about your book. They're curious about how they can get to know you better. Where can we all find you? Yes. So I have a LinkedIn um, account. It's called Urmi Hossain and people can connect with me, with me there. I have a YouTube channel. It's called Urmi Hossain. People can follow me. I have an Instagram account as well. It's called Urmi Mio, where basically like every podcast that I've been, I upload them there as a story. And I also have my blog. It's called myways.ca. And I have my book as well, which is available on Amazon and it's available Kindle and also like paper version. And it's called Discover Your Identity or Report from Interational Struggle. Thank you so much, Ernie, Ernie, for joining the Holistic Fitness Podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And for everyone listening at home, in the car or wherever you are today, eat well, move well, breathe well. And until next time, keep shining. <laughs>